Okay, maybe we can start. Um, we will continue this session with today's second lecture of Joanna. She had paused uh, on bottom-up gravi uh, gravity drill for quantum models. And uh, you can continue. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me back. So, um, Maybe I should backtrack a little bit to what I was saying before. So, I mean, are there are there any questions uh, that came up uh, during the break for you? Or is everybody okay? So let me start again a slight, few slides back to just uh, say where we were. Okay, um, in the previous hour, first I made some very general remarks about gauge gravity duality and. The reason I did this was um, to put into context this holographic condom model that I'm now introducing to you. And um, so um, now I'm going to continue to explain exactly what this model does. And um, so um, the idea is to um, solve the equations of motion that come from this model that I just wrote. Okay, so, and um, let me just uh, go back to this list that I showed at the end of last lecture um, to, to say what we are actually looking for. Okay, I already wrote the action for this model, uh, which is now a bottom-up model, which is inspired by this top-down model that I discussed, but because that's too complicated, we solve a simpler one, uh, which has the salient features of um, the model that we need. And um, so uh, as we will see, there will be a renormalization group flow, uh, which is obtained from the perturbation by this double trace operator, which we get from this interaction between the electron current and uh, the spin that we wrote in terms of these slave fermions. Um, and we will indeed see that there's a dynamical scale generation. And, and also we see some gravity realization of the screening effect that I described yesterday. And uh, so the way these things come about is um, that in, in fact, because we are in the large end limit, we can write our model as a holographic superconductor and the condensate forms in ADS2. Um, and in fact, um, in, instead of this logarithmic behavior of the resistivity, which is the kind of hallmark of the condo model in, in, in the free electron case, now here, this model will have a power law scaling of the resistivity in the infrared with a real exponent. Okay, uh, I'll also uh, describe quite a bit about um, how to calculate quantum quenches in this model. Um, then I'll um, begin also to discuss uh, entanglement entropy in this model, which I'll do in more detail tomorrow. And I'll also discuss these Fano resonances, which uh, give a nice analogy to the SYK model and uh, have some, some interesting properties of uh, which arise from the spectral function. Okay, so now the idea is to go back to the model that I motivated to you, um, which was this model. And uh, so let me just re recapitulate what this model has. So there is an Einstein-Hilbert action and there's a trans simons term, which just for completeness, I wrote as a non-abelian one, but uh, for the purpose of this lecture, I will just look at the abelian one. Okay, so this term goes away and also the trace is trivial. And so this contribution that uh, we have here. Okay. And, um, and then on there's a, ADS2 defect on which there are additional fields which come from these, uh, these 3D5 strings and these involve another gauge field and this complex scalar um, dual to the operator that will condense. And uh, so this derivative is a covariant derivative with respect to both gauge fields. So the ADS2 gauge fields and the defect value of this ADS3 gauge field. So they both enter this covariant derivative here. And uh, since we are now in a bottom up model, we don't know what our potential is. So we make the simplest possible choice, uh, which is this one. Okay, so we just put in some mass parameter for, for this complex scalar. Okay, then also because we need a uh, finer temperature as a solution to the Einstein Hilbert action, we consider the BTZ black hole, which 
introduces a temperature, and this is very similar to the lectures of Gunnar Skalm that you had uh, during this week. And uh, so this will enter exactly in this uh, precise fashion. Okay, and uh, so this ADS gauge field um, um, is due to the spurious symmetry that I introduced. And in the standard way of the ADS TFT correspondence, there's a chemical potential and a density. And um, the charge density is related to the number of boxes in, in, in the representation of SUN, uh, which we choose. Where was it? Um, so we impose this constraint. Um, actually, it's it's going to be Q divided by N here. Um, okay. So that was a kind of summary what I told you uh, in the previous hour. So before I move on, uh, um, is everybody happy with this action? So now what I'm going to do is to solve solve the equations of motion that come from this action. Okay, today I will just show you the solutions, and uh, but we can look in more detail at what exactly the equations of motion are tomorrow. Any questions? Okay, then if not, and let me go on. And and uh, so the idea is now to derive equation of motion. So um, as you see, the the most of the physics will actually happen on this ADS two slice. Because here, if we have a non-abelian, uh, sorry, if we have an abelian gauge field here in 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 this ADS three, this is non-dynamical. So I mean, we don't really consider the propagation of the electron fields. We are essentially uh, interested in the behavior of this field dual to the defect. Uh, so there are two fields dual to the defect. Uh, this one and and this complex scalar. Okay, so. Uh, I haven't written down the equation of motion. There, there's uh, uh, four of them, and um, okay, so so you, they need to be solved numerically. I have yeah. one naive question. Yeah. What's the role of this uh, uh, scalar potential here? It's probably somehow parameterized the impurity box. Yeah. Okay. I mean, um, well, the reason is that we want the scalar to condense okay so and uh, so and also um, you can because the scalar is dual to um to this uh, operator o and uh, so which is a operator of dimension a half okay um, then um, just by the relation between the scaling dimension and the mass of fields uh, we have to include a mass for the term just for the consistency of the ADS CFT approach. Okay, you know, there's this relation m squared L squared is delta into delta minus D. And uh, so in our case, delta is half and uh, D is one. So then there will be a contribution and we have to write it down. Okay, so this is just for the consistency with the general uh, standard ADS CFT approach. So, you, you wanna? Mm -hmm. So, I thought. Uh... You will have some Higgs mechanism, but the potential is not that kind of. Yeah. Ah, okay. Well, that's that's that is an ADS space. Okay, so so good oh. question. So this is the point of this holographic superconductors. Uh, due to the fact that ADS is a box, okay, oh. uh, you will have you will have a condensation even with just um, even with just this mass term. Okay, so yeah. Right, so, okay. So, okay. Yeah. Okay, Some so yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah. And just to be sure, the so this is small a gauge field is the uh, gauge field for this additional U1 symmetry phase rotation, yes. right? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yes, yeah. correct. So it, yes. it will be massive later after Higgs mechanism. Well. I think we actually, well, we don't really have a Higgs mechanism. We have a, a just a, a Goldstone boson. Okay. Oh, that's a, uh, quite opposite to usual Higgs. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know. Uh, but um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, good question. I mean, yeah, th this is an excellent question. I mean, one could think if we, we really have a, but uh, I mean, these holographic superconductors, they really describe a, a superfluid, okay? So there's only a global symmetry that is spontaneously broken. But okay, you can imagine to weakly gauge the symmetry and so on. And then there's an interesting question what would happen and so on. 
but um, I think for the time being, we should just stick with the superfluid and uh, um, and and just uh, breaking a global symmetry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. But okay, it's it's a good, valid question. I mean, I'm sure things can be said about it. Okay. So now another important ingredient is that our deforming operator is this double trace operator. Okay, so let me, okay, there's no trace because the fields are in the fundamental representation of the gauge group. So, so what I mean by double trace, I mean a product of two operators which are separately gauge invariant. Okay, so or is invariant under, as a singlet under this SUN, I mean, that's essential. So I have a product of two operators that are independently gauge invariant, and that's called a double trace deformation by analogy with operators in any Qs to force it by young mills where there uh, two traces are needed because all the fields are in the adjoint representation of the gauge group. Okay. And so now we need to implement this double trace deformation. But luckily there is a way of introducing this, um, which was introduced uh, sometime back in these two papers. So uh, given the, the scaling dimension of our field, so which is inferred from the scaling dimension of the operator O. So this field chi is dimensionless, but psi has dimension a half. So, um, and then, um, so um, if we write down the boundary expansion according to the standard rules of the ads CFT correspondence, um, this is um, the boundary behavior that we get near the boundary, okay? And so this is where z goes to zero. And um, so there's a non-normalizable and a normalizable mode. Uh, but everything is very low dimensional. So we're, we're in this area of dimensions where we can switch between normalizable and non-normalizable mode. But this standard procedure uh, introduced by these famous authors um, to introduce a double trace deformation is to impose a linear relation between the two coefficient of the two um, leading terms in the asymptotic uh, expansion of the solution. And then uh, as these authors discussed, uh, this kappa uh, will be dual precisely to this double trace uh, deformation. So it's a kind of subleading term, one over n subleading term um, in, in the boundary expansion. And uh, um, so this uh, deformation can be switched on by uh, imposing this linear relation. And then this kappa will be dual to this operator O or dagger that I introduced. Okay, this is a standard technique which is used in many, many circumstances. So this is nothing special to the condom model. We just apply standard ADS CFT results uh, to our field, which is of very low dimension. Okay. Now, um, we actually see that, um, so again, this is a standard procedure, which is also in those papers. So um, the, the, the entire field here in, um, is um, invariant under uh, renormalization. And it's a physical field and that leads to a running coupling. Okay, so uh, we can actually calculate kappa at some scale given by a temperature T, uh, which comes from our black hole um, horizon and um, and then, in fact, we get a we get a very similar behavior than the coupling that I introduced for the yesterday in the field theory model. I mean, I showed you this calculation of um, condo uh, and the resummation of the coupling, and um, actually, uh, um, so if this is the UV value of the the coupling uh, or the, the, the bare coupling, if you want, then. Um, we get a renormalized coupling of a very, very similar form than I discussed yesterday in the field theory, just by applying this um, technique of this double trace deformation. Okay, and then again, we have the same type of divergence uh, as I discussed yesterday, and we do have this uh, dynamical scale generation. Okay, so on the next slide, <clears throat> 
I'm just going to show you a plot of this function. Okay, let me show you a plot of this function. So there's no further calculation in just plotting this. Hey, Johanna. Yeah. What is the origin of this lambda in holographic calculation? I, yeah, I think this is a boundary cutoff. I so mean, this because, cutoff? yeah. This is a UV boundary cutoff. Yeah. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> okay, and then so we can um, we can this is just a plot of this function and it diverges at some particular. Uh, no, no, particular. I'm, I'm I'm sorry. The, is it holographic calculation or? Yeah, yeah. This is entire holographic calculation. I'm just I'm talking about the scalar field. So phi is the scalar field. Okay, so. The scalar field in my gravity action. What was your choice of M? Uh, M is such that it corresponds to um, the, the, so as I said, psi is dimension a half, chi is dimension zero. This means O is dimension a half. And then uh, this M will be, okay, now we have to calculate delta times delta minus D. I think it's exactly at the right number of written amount. Okay, so that's why there is a condensation process. In there. So here you choose m squared such that the uh, delta plus and delta minus is equal. Uh, okay, I have to okay. check again. <laughs> um, um, well, okay, we choose. Uh, I don't think. That's probably quite true because um, here I have a logarithm and there there's no logarithm. So, but yeah, maybe so, I mean, delta, yeah. plus and delta minus is equal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you're absolutely right. Okay, yes, thanks. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yes, very good. Okay, so and um, now the logarithm appears because they're equal, and then we have, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so this means uh, there's it's there's a condensation if we flow along the radial direction. So is there any small amount of, uh, I mean, justification or motivation to choose um, M squared to that value apart from that uh, you reproduce the logarithm? No, I mean, it's the other way around. Okay, I know mm. what my field theory fields are. Mm. Psi has dimension a half and chi has dimension zero. And this is what I know from the field theory condo model. Okay, mm. so this is my input. It, it's, it's really nice that it all works out nicely, but I'm not cheating. Yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm starting from some, some input and um, which is just the dimensions of the fields in the field theory. Psi has a half, chi has zero. This means O has a half. Okay, and then the so delta for O is a half, and from this I calculate m squared. I just calculate it. Okay, mm -hmm. and then with this m squared uh, and this delta, I get this boundary behavior. And then using this double trace approach and uh, demanding that phi is invariant under renormalization, I get precisely the running of the coupling that. I want for the condo model. So it's a non-trivial result that this works on the gravity side. So could you explain uh, what is the, uh, I mean, the translation of the statement uh, phi is invariant under renormalization? What do you mean in holography? Well, it just means that um, this, um, so this, this entire solution, okay, not just the boundary expansion, but, um, the entire solution should be invariant if I change this t. Okay, and and uh, so okay. So if you want, I can show you more details tomorrow. It's really just using a result from this paper of Witten from uh, uh, twenty years ago. And um, so he he says if if the entire solution is. Um, um, in, invariant then uh, at the boundary for, for um, this independence of the, the scale that I choose given by, um, in this case, by the temperature, uh, I get this dependence. Okay, if you're interested, I can show you the calculation tomorrow uh, using my iPad. Um, 
So uh, the, the one curiosity is that, you know that this, uh, uh, I mean, the uh, uh, one loop or I mean the uh, rainbow diagram summation is a valid only uh, up to the scale of lambda and the below that, this is not correct, right? And in holography, we expect uh, maybe something better, such that uh, it should be it should uh, give us some something that is working all the way down to the uh, zero energy. Yeah. Okay. You have to be a little careful because we have two couplings. Okay. So there's the tough coupling. Okay. So or the the coupling between the uh, electrons. And that's always strong coupling. But this kappa here, okay, so this is this additional coupling, which is in this flavor sector, uh, which is our um, condo coupling, okay? So this is the, this, the uh, yeah, I see. I see. And this can run, okay? And the statement is, even if the electrons are strongly coupled now among themselves, the condo coupling has a very similar behavior than what we had in, in the perturbative case. Okay, so in here I just plot I plot um, this function, and okay, it diverges, and this divergence again sets me the condo temperature, just exactly the same as in the field theory model. Okay, so I guess that most uh, interesting. Question should be how did you identify condo coupling uh, in ADS setup? Yeah, because I know it's a double trace deformation. Okay, so I okay, I really start from the field. It's a good question because this is really important. I really make use of the fact that I have this top-down approach, I know what my field theory fields are, I know what I want. Okay, so I'm just implementing what I want and then the gravity calculation gives expected results, okay, up to the fact that the electrons are strongly coupled, okay. So I want this operator, okay, so this is our condo model, okay, we have psi and chi, I use these fields identities and the large n limit, and I know that my interaction is this double trace term. So I want to implement this double trace term in my holographic model. But luckily, I know exactly how to do this because I can apply this method of Witten from 2001, who already studied uh, double trace operators. Okay, so I can really, because I have this top down structure, I can really write down exactly what I want. And I don't have to guess. Okay, so, so we want this operator. This is a double trace operator made out of this operator. For this operator, we know everything. We know the symmetries, we know the dimension, and so on. So as we discussed, um, since we know this dimension, we know uh, what this mass is supposed to look like, uh, this one, OK? But now um, I also know which deformation I want to switch on. I want to switch on O or dega. This is a double trace deformation. So I have to use the methods in ADS-CFT for double trace deformation. And these people tell us that the method that we have to use is to impose a linear relation between these two coefficients. Okay. And then due to this renormalization argument, so which if you want, I can reproduce in more detail tomorrow, mm. I get this behavior with a UV cutoff, so like an epsilon or so cutting off at the boundary and the temperature which sets my scale. And if you now just I plot this function, I, I just see that this coupling, which is an additional second coupling, additional to my proofed coupling, which is large, okay. This coupling has this behavior, but it, the gravity calculation, so just solving the gravity equation of motion with this ansatz, where I'm forced to solve linear relation at the boundary, gives me precisely a running of the condo coupling that I expect from the field theory, okay. But the input I have used is just, I know which fields I want and which dimension they have. And I have a model which has equations of motion and I solve them 
with particular boundary conditions which are appropriate for this double trace deformation. And then I get something which looks very similar to what I told you yesterday. But this is a result. Okay, it's not input. <laughs> Does that answer your question? I have some of them, but I still uh, have the question that the uh, I expected uh, something better than uh, just a perturbative or beta function result. So this you do have a singularity here, right? Yeah, yeah, but this is exactly the beta function is negative. Okay, yes. and my coupling gets stronger right. and it diverges. Uh, right. So it, it means that the uh, just the, uh, only in one side, the beta function is describing the physics and the beyond that we need a, something uh, more, right? Like a conformal field theory or uh, Wilson. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, well, we will have the holographic superconductor. Okay, so the, the, the result is that in, in when you have the holographic model, uh, in this branch, we will describe the flow by this condensation process. Okay, okay, so now this is this next step. Okay, very good. So very, very good question because this is the next step. Right. Uh, now, actually, there will be a phase transition. So, the answer to your question what happens here? Right. Okay. The question is well, the scalar models can describe it that side or not. That is the really yeah, yeah. I'm going to show you. Oh. This is exactly what I want to show. <laughs> so the, in this region, phi the expectation value of phi is vanishes. Okay. <laughs> but on this side, uh, it will be non-zero. Okay, so and uh, so the divergence of the coupling determines the condo temperature. And now uh, there is a transition temperature to a phase with a condensed scalar, which will be in this region. And for, I mean, numerically, we find that they don't exactly coincide. This temperature is a little smaller. It's about here, just very close, but a little smaller than this divergence. Okay. And at this transition temperature, so we then find solutions with an expectation value for this O. So we have an ADS2 holographic superconductor, which gives us an expectation value for O, and this O describes the new phase. Okay, so yeah, this is the, the picture, okay? So we have an RG flow from the UV to the IR. And again, so there's a UV fixed point and there's an IR fixed point. Now, from the point of view of the CFT, the difference to the original condom model is that here we have strongly interacting electrons and there we also have strongly electron, interacting electrons, but that's not the flow we consider. Okay, so this coupling is always strongly strong. Okay. So we trigger this RG flow um, by switching on this double trace deformation, which is um, this condo operator. And then, so we run along this flow and then we pass this condo temperature. And now because we can use ADS-CFT, we know what happens in this phase, which is a non-trivial condensate forms and that determines the physics of this IR fixed point. So this is, I think this is the answer to your question. Right, but the your result doesn't describe such a physics. Why not? <laughs> I haven't shown you anything. You see? I mean, the can you go back? Yeah, sure. Yeah, here. I mean, the uh, you, you start from the uh, large temperature and then you run it, and then you consider T as the some energy scale or yeah. parameter. Yeah, and then this result shows that at the I mean, this is singularity. I mean, the your result is over there and the completely different theory take over. Yeah, but I know what this different, completely different theory yeah, and, uh, is. I mean, the, 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 what you described is uh, just uh, you reproduce that just uh, uh, a perturbative result beyond no. the, you don't no, have- No, 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 because I, okay, I haven't shown you exactly what I, I know what happens. This is the main statement of, I want to make. I know what happens in this region because it will, the gravity tells me, okay, 
I, if I believe ADS-CFT, of course, I know what happens in this region because at this fixed point, the theory is described by this ADS holographic superconductor, which has this condensate. So this is the answer to your question. I know what happens here because I, I, the graph, if I believe what ADS-CFT says, because I have a new state with a new ground state here. Yo, Johanna, what I'm saying is that if we have a correct theory, which connect from this UV to IR, there should not appear any singularity on this uh, RG flow. Wait, okay. So, <laughs> the, wait, uh, the, the, the thing is, this, of course they should, because this determines the condo temperature. If it no, doesn't I divert, we don't know that we have a condo effect. The order of magnitude determination, uh, which is coming from this uh, uh, beta function solution, but that is a precisely what I think is not valid in the exact approach. So if we want the, if we want the holographic theory better than the, that, uh, I mean, the perturbative result, we should have, I mean, the flow of kappa, kappa t without singularity. No, I don't agree. I'm sorry, <laughs> I really don't agree. I mean, the, the point is that we want a singularity because that's exactly where the, the condo, this defines our condo temperature. If we don't have a singularity, we don't have a condo. Well, I, think that, I think the singularity is uh, just the uh, uh, artifact of the perturbative theory. Well, but here in this case, we get it as a solution of our gravity. So a well-defined, you know, I'm, I, I described yeah. to you an absolutely well-defined procedure. We're just solving equations of motion in a gravity theory, okay? okay. And, and, and uh, so it, the solution has two uh, properties. One of all, first of all, there is this divergence which indicates that we have a convo temperature. But then on top of it, and that's the answer to your question, I think, is we know what happens in this phase because then we have this uh, theory with the condensate. So that's, that's why ADS-CFT tells us more than um, the, the usual field theory because we, we have absolute control over what happens here. Uh, no. <laughs> yes. I mean, <laughs> okay, let me show, I mean, maybe we should go on. And I, I, I'm absolutely sure about this. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I, I see what you are more is about, but I think this is just the, the, the result of this. Hello, Professor. Uh, I, yeah. I also have a, some, one similar question. Yeah. How do you interpret about the QED's triviality? Because triviality, we we'll say QED has triviality because it has some singularity on the RG flow. But if your statement is correct, this means that this triviality does not, does not have and your statement beyond our standard understanding. So in this sense, I think our should, no, should not have any singularity. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is different from QED because I mean, there's this strongly coupled background. Uh, yes, okay. I, I, just, I just give a, a, a textbook example set. Yeah, I mean, and the theory, this is just the point. The theory is not trivial. Okay, so um, I, I mean, this singularity just describes the fact that we have a condo tr transition. Okay. okay, let me ask one question. If a, if a uh, QD the compound constant goes too very strong, would you say this theory has a non-trivial thing there? Okay, I'm not sure we can compare this model to QED. It's, it's really quite different. I mean, okay, maybe, can I come back to the question once I explained what happens now in this phase? Because um, let, let, let me, okay, I think let, let's look at this. So, so, okay, the only thing I'm doing is I'm solving the gravity equations of motion, which are dual to my uh, condo model, okay? And um, so, uh, I, I mean, the, the, the entire setup is strongly coupled because the electrons are strongly correlated. And all I'm saying is that in this model, I get a new phase corresponding to this IR fixed point, which is characterized by a non-trivial condensate. And I will show you that this non-trivial condensate has exactly some properties of the condo model that we would like. Okay, I think maybe we're going too little too fast. I, I would like to postpone this 
discussion to a little later because I haven't shown you anything. Okay. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. Let, me, let me let me let me show you what what we do, and and then we can come back to your questions. Um, so I'm claiming that what we're going to see is okay. We what the input is that we put this double trace deformation. Okay. And so all I'm saying at the moment is that um, there will the infrared physics will be characterized by a non-trivial condensate for this operator O. And now let's study this physics and see that it has properties that we expect from the condo physics, but condo physics in a this strongly coupled setting. Okay. Okay. Maybe let me just show you the solutions to the equation of motion and then we can come back to your questions. Okay. So what we find is that this is a ADS2 holographic superconductor. Uh, which means that uh, at a temperature TC, which is a little smaller than this TK at which we have this divergence, uh, a condensate will form. So the condensate is uh, this coefficient. Yeah. Um, so, so let me see, I say again what kappa and beta are. Here, kappa and beta are here, yeah, okay. So I'm calculating uh, kappa times beta, um, as a function of the temperature. And so because there is a holographic superconductor, there is a transition temperature, which is close to this condo temperature, uh, where a phase transition happens. And the phase transition is a mean field transition, which is not surprising because we are in the large end limit, okay? And um, so this left-hand plot is just a zoom into this region here, okay? So here the scale, uh, you see uh, it goes almost all the way to zero. And uh, here we see as mean field, so there's this nice square root behavior. And, and so this looks almost like in a BCS superconductor. So we have this mean field transition. So there's this TC above which the condensate is zero. And then here um, it- um, Johanna? Yeah. What determines the TC? Well, TC is, um, the phenomenological temperature at which when I numerically solve the equations of motion, I see the appearance of a condensate. Right, and for example, in superconductivity, right? Mm -hmm. TC is uh, derived uh, by uh, chemical potential or density. What is the corresponding object here? Uh, I think, okay, I don't think you can, okay, the problem is because we have to solve these coupled differential equations. Yeah, right. Just look at the solution and then there's a, this is essentially a bifurcation. Um, yeah. And I think there have been some papers by Chris Herzog also, where in some very specific cases he was do we able to do something analytical? But I think this question is beyond um, our capability because we can only numerically solve this equation of motion. I think I once talked to an applied mathematician if he could tell us how to determine this TC. So this is where the bifurcation point of the differential equation, uh, the solution of the differential equation is. But uh, he looked at our equation and he said they are too complicated. We, we cannot say anything. <laughs> uh, so, so my honest answer is I, I don't know. I can just numerically solve and then I see this TC. Yeah, but I'm just Johanna. I mean, see, see, let's think just in simple way that is uh, because we are not working uh, in some quantum divergent quantity. Everything is calculated or just the classical. I mean, the uh, of yes, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. motion, right? So there, without, I mean, the externally given scale, we cannot create any scale. So there must be some scale given to the theory. And the question is, what is that here? Well, I mean, okay, I, I can only say again, we, we solve the differential equation with the boundary condition of having this kappa, which, and, and of course this double trace deformation um, creates this boundary RG flow, okay? And um, 
yeah, in some sense that that triggers an RG flow to this new uh, IR fixed point. Yeah, maybe maybe we can postpone. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that maybe let me just explain the strategy some more time. Yeah. So I'm I have this action. This action. Everything here is determined by my field theory input about the size uh, and dimensions of the fields that are involved. Okay. And I know I want to perturb, I create a RG flow by this double trace deformation, which means I impose a linear relation here and uh, uh, this kappa will be dual to my flow. Then I solve the equations of motion numerically, okay, because it's too hard. Well, I didn't do it. My collaborators <laughs> solved the equations numerically. And um, apart from this behavior, um, they, they find that there is a, trans it's a ADS to holographic superconductor, okay, which is the so holographic superconductor is exactly this. There, there is a critical temperature, which is hard to determine because we just numerically solve the equations of motion, where there's a bifurcation of the solution and the new ground state has a, uh, a condensate. And this, if this condensate is non-zero, it will spontaneously break precisely the spurious symmetry that we introduced before. Okay, good. So my answer to your question, even if you're not happy with it, <laughs> I know what happens at this fixed point. I just have this new ground state with this condensate. Okay. And that determines the physics and the physics it gives actually really has, now we have to show that the solution has features of the condom model, okay? Or we can examine its features and some things are very similar to what we had before and uh, some other things, um, a bit different, okay, but I will, show, I will go through lots of examples, okay. So the first thing is, if we claim that this is a condom model, we should see some screening of the degrees of freedom. Okay, and indeed, indeed we do see screening uh, of the degrees of freedom because, so if we are at the boundary of the anti dissitor space, uh, we can calculate the flux of this field AT through the boundary of our space. And if we do this, this we can either do analytically if we are exactly at the boundary before there's any breaking. And in this case, it's precisely equal to this little Q, which is the charge density for my um, slave fermions. Okay. So, this counts the degrees of freedom because it also this was chosen to count the number of boxes in in um, in this representation of SUN. Now, if I lower the temperature, um, so here now I'm looking at um, this. This is this exactly the same flux, but now calculated at the black hole horizon. Okay, and now I go down with the temperature and I see that it decreases. And this decrease means that this number is, has to decrease, which means I have less degrees of freedom than I had before. And that's exactly the screening. Okay, so remember what we said yesterday about the screening, a single forms and one of these electrons get bound to, to this impurity spin. And in this way, uh, um, the number of the, the, the screening is that if you're far away, you cannot see this um, magnetic impurity anymore. And that's the screening. And here now we see exactly, we have this very big spin impurity with Q boxes. And now the flux tells you, you know, how many degrees of freedom are there in around this impurity. So it's like putting a sphere around the impurity and, and having a kind of Gauss law. And so that's what this really says. And, and now we can actually numerically show the number of degrees of freedom decreases. And this is precisely the screening. Now, if we had critical screening, it should go all the way to zero, but this we cannot see. And so one problem I can explain to you about this model is that it's very, very hard to say anything about zero temperature numerically. 
And that's due to the fact that we use this probe approximation. And if we really go to zero temperature, we should include the back reaction. And so all the statements about t equal to zero, they have to be taken with a little grain of salt because really our approximation is not good enough for them. But we see a clear tendency that there's a decrease of the number of degrees of freedom. And this is our gravity realization of the screening. So what is the TC? What happens at TC? At TC, the condensate forms. And therefore, there is a condensation. There is yeah. a screen. So if there's condensation, we break this spurious U1 symmetry by this condensate, OK? And that's interpreted as the screening, yeah. Okay. So right. So I think that screening should be completed near 1, right? Not at 0. Uh, what do you mean? Because uh, if there is a condensation, right? At TC, that's a phase transition point. Yeah. And the U charge is interpreted as a spin, right? So what should happen is that near at, at one, okay? What do you mean by yeah, one? Beyond the right? one, near and uh, beyond the TC, uh, you have uh, maybe some non-trivial, I mean, the spin. But uh, at the one or near there, I think the screening should uh, uh, complete should be completed, right? Why? I mean the uh, the screening. I'm not sure. Okay, so screening. You in your case, screening is completed near zero, not at one. So, in some sense, uh, phase transition is happening near zero, not at one. So, which is not. Sorry, no, 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 no. I think you missed that. There's um, some misunderstanding. Okay, uh, so this is where the condensate forms. Okay. Yeah. So, so here above, there's no condensate. And then mm -hmm. at the critical temperature, a condensate forms. Okay. Yes. So now I claim that this is a sign of the condo effect. So, to, to give some substantiate my claim that this is the condo effect, I should say that this corresponds in some way to some screening. Okay, so this is a new statement. Okay. So now, if I have, wait, 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 wait. The so, condensation is completed only, so I'm sorry, the screening is completed only at near zero temperature. Yes, okay. But nevertheless, okay, so it, it's it's a there's already some partial screening happening here. Okay, as soon, I mean, okay. So what I want to say is, okay, so I have to explain why this condensation explains uh, corresponds to screening. And so the best I can do is to calculate this flux, which is proportional to the amount of degrees of freedom in this magnetic impurity. Now, at the phase transition, uh, which is here, this has some particular value. OK, so there's a certain number of boxes in my uh, magnetic impurity. Now, if I decrease the temperature, uh, oops, sorry. If I decrease the temperature, it means I go along this curve. And so there's this mean field behavior. So th there's already a partial screening setting in, OK? So this means that as I go along, there's already this partial screening setting in, and I see an, the decrease of the number of degrees of freedom. So the, the, the difference to the model we had yesterday, yesterday we only talked about a spin and a half. Now we have a spin with Q boxes in the representation. So there are many, many degrees of freedom in our spin impurity. And by this condensate, when the condensate is present, this number, which counts the amount of degrees of freedom, decreases. And I think that makes total sense. Okay, there's already a partial screening setting in. Um, so, so at, what I'm saying is a T a TC. It seems that it is so smoothly happening. So that's what I'm was worrying about. Maybe yeah, is it smoothly? I mean, if you have a, I mean, it's also a kind of. If for okay, the resolution is not very good, but I think there's also a kind of square root behavior here. Don't you think so? And if you put a line here. 
but the usually, I mean, the, we consider the TC is a something where it is a touching the bottom, not the uh, this smooth uh, region at one near one. Right, but I mean, even here, this I mean, this is a second order phase transition. You know, I mean, it's continuous. I mean, it's I know the derivative is small, but. Um, th there's, you know, th there's one point where there's no condensate, and then the condensate sets in, and you know, it, it's it's a, it's not a first order; it's a second order phase transition. So I think it's totally okay to have this behavior. Yeah. And I agree with you. I mean, if we had critical screening, which means we have exactly the same amount of flavors. Remember yesterday when I was talking about over, under, and critical screening. If we had really precisely this critical screening, this should go all the way to zero here. But unfortunately, our model is not good enough to resolve exactly what happens at zero. Okay, so we have to be happy with the fact that it decreases. Okay, okay thank you very much. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. I mean, <laughs> okay, I try to be honest. But I think I'm, I'm just saying I solved the equation of motion and I find something which has a condensate and yeah, this yeah. displays some features Fine. of the condensate model. Okay, I'm not saying any more. Okay, it's good. Fine. All right. Um, Good. So for now, let me this be the uh, only this was just a calculation to confirm that what we do makes sense. Okay. And um, so now there's other things which you can do to confirm that it makes sense. I, I'll probably tell them a little bit about those tomorrow. But today I wanted to show a little more what can we now actually do with this. Okay. One example that we can do with this is to consider a time dependence. Yeah? So we, we allow for a time dependence of the condo coupling and study the response of the condensate. So this is something called a quantum quench. Okay? And um, so that becomes very complicated because then we have to solve partial differential equations because there will be a radial dependence and a time dependence. And then you have two variables and then everything becomes quite complicated. So, uh, so there's some examples that we can study for the uh, time dependence. So we can just have a Gaussian pulse in, in the infrared. So, so if I say the infrared, I, it means I, I, go, I go to a region beyond this point, okay? So I, 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 can, I can tune this kappa. I can either start here and just put a pulse then I can introduce a time dependence where this runs from here to there that I would call IR to UV, or I can start there and just um, quench it to see what happens if I run there, okay? But everything happens in this condensed phase. And so what we see is that we get some results that are very expected from the ads CFT correspondence because uh, as you probably know, um, in, in ADS-CFT, we can use this quasi-normal mode uh, analysis. So quasi-normal modes are complex frequency, eigenfrequencies of your fluctuation modes about the solutions of the equations of motion, okay? So what we do is we solve the equations of motion of this gravity action that I showed to you. And then once you have the solutions, which I partially showed to you, we can study small fluctuations about them. And these small fluctuations, they will have eigenfrequencies and these can be complex. So if eigenfrequencies are complex, this means uh, rather than just corresponding to, to a peak in your spectral function, there will be also a width. And you know, so if a, the, the imaginary part leads to a damping and a decay. Okay. And um, okay, so the time scales are governed by these quasi-normal modes. Okay, so complex eigenfrequencies and as usual in ADS-CFT, everything goes very fast. I mean, this is one feature of the strong coupling described by ADS-CFT that um, these time scales are usually very, very short. And um, so, um, okay, so let's study the complex eigenfrequencies of the fluctuations in the gravity system. Okay, so the complex eigenfrequencies of the fluctuations about the solution of the gravity equations of motion determine the time evolution. But so what is very interesting is um, that these uh, um, frequencies also determine the poles in the Green's functions. 
Okay, so this is not something which is restricted to ADS-CFT. This is a, you know, um, a standard analysis of these fluctuations in gravity systems. If you then use Kubo formula to calculate uh, uh, transport coefficients using correlation functions, then um, th these uh, eigenfrequencies will correspond to the, the poles in these green functions. Okay, so now what we discover is that if we are in the condensed phase, okay, so this is again for different uh, temperatures, so we lower the temperature here, so this is our TC, we just cross and then we go down here, so that's the, the leading uh, quasi normal mode, and um, so, and they are all on the imaginary axis, so there's no real part here, okay, and um, so, and what we also find is that um, the frequency of the pole of the spectral function is proportional to minus i and then the square, the mod square of this condensate. And that's actually something that's known as corresponding to the condo resonance. So, so there's something called the condo resonance, which is a particular peak in the spectral function um, uh, of, of these, um, um, the modes that, that we have been studying. And we, we can reproduce uh, this resonance by, by looking at the poles, uh, which we obtain from the fluctuations of our gravity solution. So that's another sign that what we are doing is consistent with general pictures of the, the condo model, okay? Or I should say this is something which survives, this is some concept from the weakly coupled condo model which survives in the, the strongly coupled one. Okay, so let me show you some examples of, um, of this quench. Okay, so this quench is also determined by this quasi normal mode. Okay, so this is our input. So we, we take this coupling kappa. So you see it goes from uh, nine to one or so. Okay, in a time scale which in these units uh, is about uh, 60 here. Okay, so let's go back to to this picture. Okay, so here you see I start at nine, which is about there. And then I make this thing time dependent and it runs all the way until it, it goes somewhere here. Okay, so I really start there where the phase transition happens and then, and then I go deeper into the region with the condensate. Okay, let's go there. Okay, and then so you see um, the time scale here is well, it's about sixty. So that's the input into the calculation. And now from again solving the equations of motion, which now are partial differential equations, uh, rather more complicated to solve them, we can study um, the mod of this condensate, which tells us um, whether we are in this condensed. Uh, screen phase or not. And so nine is a value where there's where we are above the phase transition. And so it means we start above the phase transition and then uh, make the system go into the um, into the uh, screen phase. And then you see, okay, so since we start above the transition, the condensate is zero when we start. And then what is interesting is that very long time, nothing happens. Although I see here at 60, I'm already in the condensed phase, but here at 60, uh, nothing happens. So the system still stays in the normal phase up to here. And then suddenly <laughs> it goes to a finite value and stays there. Okay, so there's this very sudden. So this you can also imagine just from a superconductor. I mean, you, so you're in the normal phase and then you essentially cool below the transition temperature and the system still stays in this phase, which is now unstable and then zoom, it goes. <laughs> okay, so and the fact it goes so fast is because we are in the strongly coupled background. Okay, so, uh, and this is a sign of something that only happens in, in holography because so these time scales are so short, but it's interesting to see that, you know, for quite a some time, this phase remains metastable before we actually uh, go to the condensed phase. 
Okay, other questions? Okay. So this is just an example which can nicely be done using solving this gravity equations of motion. Okay, and um, so we can also um, again study the screening. So how how does the screening evolve um, when we turn on if, when we go to the new phase where the screening takes place? And actually, um, consistently with this picture, we see an exponential fall off of the number of degrees of freedom at the impurity. Okay, so I think that's the next point. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm doing again the same with the screening as I was doing before. Okay, so we consider the flux at the horizon, which is proportional to the number of impurity degrees of freedom. And now um, we, we, we study this as a function of time. Okay, here is some slightly odd variable. So this is time again, and this is now just exactly this flux that I was looking at before. I don't know why it's called log g there, but it's exactly the same as here. This, this thing again, okay, so this and um, so okay uh, first the, it, it takes for some time for the system to settle I mean this is a, some numerical uh, artifact okay we start at zero and the system settles uh, but then we go to the new phase and then you see this exponential so there's a logarithmic there <laughs> so exponentially the number of degrees of freedom decreases. So we really see that the screening happens um, and very fast and exponentially the degrees of freedom that are in our magnetic impurity um, are screened. Okay, that, that's what we see here. Okay, so now the question is, of course, if, uh, can, I mean, in principle, I think this could be measured experimentally, but of course, um, it's not very easy to do, but I mean, you know, we can certainly ask some condensed matter physicists um, about these things. All right, okay, that's what I wanted to say about this time dependence. Okay, so this is some rather dif complicated differential equations that one has to solve, but it, it gives some rather nice physics. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is about the relation to the Sajtev Kitayev model, which is extremely famous and also in, because it also has a gravity dual. Um, can, yeah. Can I see the previous diagram? <laughs> is it yeah, like, so. um, can I consider it as a Hawking page phase transition? Like this page gif, is it very similar to page gif? <laughs> That's true. Uh, uh, well, it looks similar, but there's a slight difference in the sense that I'm just looking at all these probes. Okay, so the gravity background stays unchanged. It's just these matter fields which behave in a particular way. Mm. Uh, and it's not the geometry itself, not the black. So the black hole doesn't do anything. It just sits there in the background. And I'm considering, um, I'm considering the evolution um, of, of, of these matter fields there. And, um, but, okay. Uh, I think some other people, I forgot who it was pretty recently, people doing uh, numerical ADSFT uh, have studied, um, you know, time evolution of black holes in ADS space and get some objects which look like the page curve. Uh, I think Van Ski and somebody working in this area. So, so the question is valid, and I, I mean, it's a very good question, and, and there's people working on this, but I think this model is a lot simpler than uh, making the whole gravity thing uh, collapse. I mean, here we just look at some fields in the gravity background. So in that sense, our model is a lot simpler. But you're right. Um, it looks very similar, and I think there have been some numerical calculations of this, but they're, of course, much more involved. In yeah, yeah, thank uh, you so much. Yeah. 
Yeah, good question. Okay. Now, um, I, I wanted to explain. So there's this famous such a Kitayev model, which is uh, very much discussed in the context of uh, ABS CFT in relation to quantum chaos and uh, many interesting things. And um, so, so our model, in some sense, is a lot simpler, but it's not totally unrelated to this model. So that model is a quantum mechanics model in zero plus one dimensions. But of course, as you saw previously, most of the things I'm doing happen in zero plus one dimensions. I mean, the, the electrons, they are kind of uh, a little bit spectators. And I mean, it's just this boundary condition that plays a role. OK, um, so the Sashtivi Kitayev model is a model that involves Majorana fermions. OK, but here all the way along, I've been talking about vial fermions. But this original model of Sashtiv in Yi is actually about vial fermions. And Kitayev uh, extended or changed this, proposed a different model, which is the same model as Sashtiv in Yi, but not for complex, but for, for Majorana fermions. But here, uh, for this U1 symmetry that I was discussing, let's stick with the, the vial fermions. OK. OK. <clears throat> um, so this is the model. And so these fields are called chi because they're, they're fermions in 0 plus 1 dimensions. And in that sense, they're very similar to our slave fermions that we introduced to uh, describe um, the spin. And uh, Mardis, I think you asked this yesterday. So uh, precisely if I, I mean, okay, I think this is the answer to your question. <laughs> so you, you were asking, you know, can, can I also get um, qu quartic couplings? And the answer is yes. Okay, so here people start with a, um, um, with a easing model in, in two dimensions, I think. And, uh, and then they, they put some, um, uh, there's some procedure in condensed matter called averaging over this order, which just means there's some Gaussian random coupling here. And, and then they're reduced to a single site by averaging over this disorder. Okay, so this is explained in these papers. And um, so you can already see here, if you again put these slave fermions, then you will get this quartic term. This is just a chemical potential term that is added here. And um, so then essentially, um, this averaging over the disorder gives us couplings that are disorder average, but also it means we reduce just to one one side. Okay, so it's in zero plus one dimensions. Okay, um, so and in some sense uh, this also involves a, a large n limit, which is a little different from our ADS CFT large n limit because you just take an infinite amount of components in your in your fermions here. Okay. But okay, so what I just want to say here is by, by starting with an easing model using the same Arikosov fermions, uh, slave fermions, we will arrive at this uh, such a weak tie of one. Um, so now this technique that can be used to get from this two dimensional easing model to this one dimensional, so this, this order averaging. This can also be applied um, to other situations. And in particular, in this paper, the authors uh, studied large N condo model um, in condensed matter context. So again, this is with three electrons. And um, so I, I cited this paper before because these, in this paper, it was discovered that you can write the screening as this condensation process. Okay, so this is something which is known from, from condensed matter physics. Okay, and um, so uh, the same reduction of this large end condom model, which is a different large end condom model than my large end condom model, because it's again for free electrons and large end means there's a large number of components in the fermions. But uh, this integrating out of the conduction in integrants will also lead to a single side model. Okay, so which means that things happen in zero plus one dimensions. Okay, and so these people, they calculated this spectral function for, for, for the fields, um, so for this operator O again, which they also have, and um, they find the spectral asymmetry. Um, 
Okay, maybe let me go to the next page. Yeah, this is a picture from um, from this paper. Okay, so it's uh, the, the imaginary part of the retarded Green's function for for this precisely this op, uh, o, o dagger. So O is our operator which condenses in our model. Okay, which also condenses in that model. And um, so alpha is a different. Um, uh, filling fraction. So in our case, this would be related to this little to this capital Q. Okay, the number of boxes, and but a slightly different scale is chosen. So when um, here, uh, when alpha is zero, then we have um, Q is equal to n halves. So there, there's as many particles as antiparticles. Okay, and um, and then in that case you see that you get a, a beautiful anti-symmetric uh, spectral function here but if you break the particle hole symmetry uh, then the spectral function becomes asymmetric okay okay and why is this interesting the, because um, the beginning of this enthusiasm ab about the syk model well rather more the such a v model uh, with complex fermions um, originated from this paper because um, um, such a show that um, that the spectral asymmetry is related um, to the entropy of the ADS2 black hole. Okay, um, so so this is this asymmetry parameter omega, which um, which appears here, and um, and. He, in this paper, there's a map of this parameter to, to essentially the thermal entropy of the black hole in ADS2. And that was the kind of first sign that this model has a gravity dual in ADS2. Okay, so that, that was at the beginning of this enthusiasm about this model. Um, okay. So, there's a this asymmetry in some sense can be related to the entropy of the black hole. Okay, uh, so let me discuss this in a little more detail. So, so these curves they're examples of a so-called Fano resonance. Okay, Fano is an Italian physicist and he wrote a very famous paper about the same time as Kondo. So, so the paper is from 1961 or so about these Fano resonances. Mm. So, um, so this what I showed to you here. This curve is an example of a so-called Fano resonance, and I will explain what this is. Okay, in a second. And uh, in our holographic model that I just described to you, we we also have such resonances. Um, so these resonances are also observed in in the holographic model. Okay, I will come to that. Okay, so so here is uh, essentially a summary of this paper by Fano from 1961, and he uh, considers, for instance, an atom on which you shine light or something like this. Okay, so light scattering of an atom. So and so the atom again is an impurity. It sits at some point in space and doesn't move, and the light passes and interacts with it and scatters. Okay. So, so uh, what he considers is that a discrete set of resonance states interacts with a continuum of states. And um, that leads, he shows that this leads to a particular form of the spectral function, which is this one. Okay, now we have to be extremely careful because there is another Q here, but this Q has nothing to do with the little Q I had before. Okay, this is just, I follow Fano's notation here, but. It's a bit unfortunate that this has the same name, but this is the so-called asymmetry parameter and has nothing to do with this little Q that I introduced in counting the number of degrees of freedom in our magnetic impurity. Okay, so it's something different. Okay, <clears throat> so this parameter Q has a um, physical interpretation in that its, its square is proportional to the ratio of the probability of resonant scattering divided by the probability of non-resonant scattering, okay? So resonance scattering meaning means there's an interaction with the degrees of freedom. Non-resonance is just a kind of reflection 
Okay. And so he, he discusses that in the spectral function for, for the slide. In his case, uh, okay, so this is uh, the point where there's the maximum of this, in the peak in the spectral function, that's the width, okay? And, and then um, this Q is, is this asymmetry parameter. So, um, and um, so now let's discuss different values of this little Q. Okay, so um, this spectral function of Fano um, can be um, decomposed into um, three terms. Okay, so the first one is one. So this is just a rewriting of this spectral function is one. Okay, so this, this is a description of our Fano resonance and um, one just corresponds to the continuum. Okay, so nothing is happening. Um, then uh, this term uh, corresponds to the resonance of the discrete state, so the atom that sits there in, in this case. And then there's a term with this little q, this asymmetry parameter, so this q is this q, uh, which gives a, a mixing between the continuum of um, the light passing through and, um, and this discrete state sitting there. And, and so this gives the interaction between the two essentially. Okay, so you see if Q is equal to zero, there's no, no interaction. Okay, so now let's uh, look at different possibilities for, for this Q. Um, so if Q is equal to zero, then the spectral function has a dip like this. Okay, so Q equals to zero means um, that uh, the, the probability of, of resonance scattering is zero. So there is no interaction with, um, between the impurity and the ambient fields. Um, if Q is infinity, then you know, uh, this means that you know, we essentially see the, the peak which is associated to this impurity there. And um, if, if they're equally uh, likely, these two, then we get an uh, anti-symmetric spectral function. And, and that's exactly uh, what uh, these uh, people saw for the condom model, okay? So if there's exact particle hole symmetry, uh, then there's the, the asymmetry parameter uh, is one and we get this, um, this anti-symmetric behavior. And so clearly for those curves, Q is not one anymore. Uh, yeah. Can you, is this a spectral function? Uh, yeah. How it can be negative? Uh, well, it's a spectral function, which is a, Dif okay, this is because a difference is taken between a background and a signal, I think. I see. So, I see. So, yeah. it's a spectral function subtracted by background. I see. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think probably this thing is mm. subtracted mm -hmm. off. Yeah. Yeah, good point. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, Okay, so now what we did, we, we calculated the spectral functions um, for this operator O in our holographic model. Okay. And that's quite complicated. And so Yanis Pervert-Dimitrio was very decisive because um, it's, we need to do all this holographic renormalization to get the boundary terms correct and so on. This is very complicated. And uh, there's a, we wrote a quite long paper explaining this. Um, and so, okay, so here's the, the, the spectral function and now we are uh, in the normal phase. So we are just above uh, this temperature where the scalar condenses. Um, but already there, uh, we, see, um, we see an asymmet asymmetric spectral function. Okay, so, and you see the, the bigger it gets, the flatter the peak comes here, okay? And uh, so essentially um, the peak goes with one over T minus TC. So 
the closer to TC, the higher the peak is going to be. And um, so, and indeed, this is again such a funnel resonance. So here there's a resonance between the, the defect values, if you want, of the CFT continuum field. Okay, so because it's a CFT, we have a continuum of modes. And there's a resonance with the spin impurity. So the, the CFT degrees of freedom interact with the spin impurity. And, and that creates this final type resonances. And okay, so so in principle, um, if there if there's no if we if the defect is not there, we have conformal symmetry. So then of course there will be just a, a continuum. But now if we turn on this double trace operator, then we have an interaction with the spin, and and this interaction then creates this resonance in the spectral function. Okay, so now uh, super confusing <laughs> notation. We now this is the Fano asymmetry parameter. Okay, the little Q that um, I discussed here. So this one. Okay, and now again Q is the number uh, determining the, the degrees of freedom in our magnetic impurity, but it's normalized slightly differently. It's normalized as in this Kotlier paper. Okay, so. When this is zero, then really this means that the capital Q I was defining earlier is equal to n half. Okay, so then it means I have the same amount as particles and holes. Okay, so particles and antiparticles. And so, so if we are at zero, I have the same amount of particles and antiparticles. And then um, the this asymmetry parameter is just one, which means we get a, a perfect um, anti-symmetric spectrum. And um, then if we have, if we go to negative, so value smaller than in halves, uh, the asymmetry parameter becomes zero. And if we go to values bigger than a half, the asymmetry parameter is going to diverge. Okay, and so we, we, we can run the entire spectrum in our model. So this is when it's zero, that's when it's one, and that's when it's infinite. So, and we can, we can have all of these scenarios in, in our holographic model. Okay, so this is for what we have above the, the phase transition. And then um, below the phase transition, there is no asymmetry. That's what we just observed from our calculation. So the asymmetry parameter is always one. Uh, however, we see exactly that the poles of the spectral function um, coincide with our result for the um, um, for the quasi-normal modes. So the quasi the poles in the spectral function scale with minus i mod squared of the condensate. And, and that's exactly what's expected for this condo resonance. And um, um, okay, so, so our model really displays this resonance, which is a hallmark of the condo effect, uh, which is nice. Okay, I think this was quite a lot. So are there any, so I, I think about the entropy I'm going to talk tomorrow, it would be, <laughs> much more. So maybe I should stop here now and just ask more questions. Yeah, I guess, I, I guess that the, um, uh, thank you very much for your nice explanation of, I mean, bunch of works, but uh, I have <laughs> to run now to- yeah. So okay, maybe. no worries. Yeah. I will see you tomorrow. Morning. Yeah, see you Bye. tomorrow. Thanks for your questions. That was very fun to discuss. <laughs> yeah. See you tomorrow. Okay, so uh, yeah, I will be back tomorrow at eight o'clock. And uh, okay, okay, very good. <laughs> uh, see you tomorrow. See you. So are there any other any other questions? I think we have quite many questions during the talk. Maybe we can uh, stop here. Yeah, okay, we will stop here and then um, uh, I will be around tomorrow morning again. Okay, yeah, this is quite a lot of uh, things. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank okay. you very much for the yeah, so very nice talk.
Well, John Cook, uh, Frank says hello to you. I, I mentioned that you are there and he. <laughs> My also <laughs> greetings to him. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, thanks very much uh, for your patience. See you and uh, so I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks to you. Bye bye.